Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, Michael Wilson here. I'm the one of the co-chairs of this session. So on behalf of TUGS, EGS and Major Trauma Subcommittee, um, we are going to cover an EGS topic this evening that's perhaps common to everybody, but um, less uh, attractive to um, the audience this evening in terms of the upper GI audience. But nevertheless, it's a large part of our acute general surgery practice and the topic is acute lower GI bleeding. We've got two excellent speakers this evening. And without further ado, I am going to introduce uh, James Kiniston. He works alongside me at Forth Valley in Scotland. He's made quite the impression since he joined the team uh, when he moved um, from London. And he has um, changed the management of uh, lower GI bleeding here in uh, Scotland and uh, in Forth Valley um, largely as a result of our second speaker who we'll come on to um, slightly later on. So without further ado, James, over to you for your presentation. Thank you, Michael, thanks very much. Um, it's really good to be here this evening. And I know it's slightly um, off the beaten path from, from an upper GI surgeon's point of view, but as Michael said, it's a really, really common presentation in emergency general surgery. And I think it's one that's really worthwhile discussing. And I hope uh, I won't bore you too much from a colorectal point of view, but um, what I'd like to do today is start by just going through the assessment and management of lower GI bleeding, a really common presentation and something that we all see in our practice. And um, as I said to, to, to Catherine, who's going to follow me, it's not often you do a talk and you're followed by lower GI bleeding royalty, but as any of you who know, know and has read around this over the last few years, she's published some really groundbreaking guidance around this to try and give us some idea of a strategy of managing lower GI bleeding. So a lot of what I'll talk about is, is based around some of the work that she's performed. So it is on the whole in the UK managed by general surgeons in uh, different hospital settings. Um, as we're going to discuss um, in, in the near future, there's very little intervention from surgeons as a whole, which makes it slightly unusual that we do manage this. But of course, there's so many uh, conditions that we do that with, including such things as pancreatitis, as we all know. It makes up a number of the, uh, the admissions to hospitals in the UK. Um, there's a rising incidence due to the ageing population and the use of anticoagulation, the increasing use of anticoagulation. Overall, mortality rate is, you know, there's a, there's a recognised mortality reading of around 3.1%. And um, uh, this, this is kind of around right, right 10% in gen, uh, GI bleeding overall. Independent predictors of in-hospital mortality include age um, and morbidity, which is the main, main aspects of that. We discussed the changing incidence, and this is something that um, uh, Dr. Altman has written about and published previously. This is a paper from Hong Kong uh, published last year. And it's just this is a nice graph showing the blue line from upper GI bleeding, showing a reducing, reducing incidence over time versus a uh, fairly static or, incre or slightly increasing picture in some aspects of lower GI bleeding. So if this is something, uh, it's a shifting paradigm. You know, upper GI bleeding was felt to be the most common presentation of, of bleeding to hospitals. But of course, now we're seeing, as we discussed, an aging population and, and greater use of anticoagulation. So it's something that we will see and see more often in our own practice. The etiology, I mean, for the benefit of this uh, presentation, we're, we're discussing anything distal to ligament artritis as lower GI bleeding. And of course, the most notably, that will be in the, in the uh, colorectal region. And diabetic disease, as we all know, is the most one of the most common causes, certainly, uh, of colonic bleeding. Uh, although there's some epidemiological studies suggesting it's um, becoming less frequent. Um, as we all know, the, the causes uh, in the colon, um, bowel cancer, um, inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic colitis, uh, and of course we can't forget uh, hemorrhoids, uh, which I think in Kate's audit accounted for up to 16% of the presentations, and that was from the national audit, so it's something we shouldn't forget. Small bowel uh, can be a source, of less common, and, and of course brisk upper GI bleeding should not be forgotten, we'll discuss about that, discuss uh, that um, in, in, later in the talk. Inter intervention rates overall are low, but I have to say this is a very interesting graph because intervention rates will be hugely dictated by what the underlying cause of the bleeding is. Um, generally, intervention rates are low because you know diverticular disease, uh, 
uh, angiodysplasia, displays often these conditions will settle with a uh, good um reversal of anticoagulation and good use of blood products but of course there's some specific areas in there that will require intervention on a much greater scale like post polypectomy bleeding post anastomotic bleeding and um uh, hemorrhoids two big reviews in the uk um the, the nc pod review in 2015 and then followed by the uh, national audit um which was led by dr oakland who will speak next and these uh, looked and gave us a, an oversight into what is actually happening on the ground in the UK. And uh, a lot of this talk will be based around the recent, uh, or certainly in the last two to three years, guidance produced by Dr. Oakland um, by the British Society of Gastroenterology, which uh, uh, looked to give us around 17 recommendations of lower general bleeding. So we'll look at those in more detail. The logarithm from those guidance is shown here in the graph. And what we will look to do today is really focus on the right hand side of this chart which is looking at unstable bleeding um, and Dr Oakland will uh, and her presentation focus on the stable GI bleed uh, which is more on the left hand side of the chart there. So what do we do when someone comes in and is on and has lower GI bleeding or well, recognizing that is the main is the first uh, um, challenge. Um, any kind of logical clinical evaluation is the first step. Uh, identifying comorbidities and medication, we've all just discussed some of those, uh, and that would include uh, anticoagulation, antiplatelets, and um, uh, use of NSAIDs and, and such like. And then it's a case of just deciding, is this person in hypovolemic shock? One of the easy ways of doing that, and something that's been utilized in trauma and, and is utilized in the logarithm is the shock index which is the heart rate divided by the systolic blood pressure, that gives a very quick indication if someone is stable or unstable, and then leads into knowing whether an intervention is required there and then, or something that, some, this is something that can be either managed ambulatory or as an inpatient and conservatively watched. We touched upon it earlier, but we mustn't forget the digital wet examination. I think this is quite a common thing now, people being admitted to hospital, it, has, it is being missed. Um, there is still a purpose for this. Uh, you know, hemorrhoids, as we spoke about, are uh, made up 16, roughly 16% 16 of presentations in the national audit. But of course, rectal cancer, something that will not be seen on a CT or CT angio, so it can be missed. And also the assessment of the colour of the stool is this fresh blood melina. And this is something that we should not forget, but it's imperative in the clinical assessment. So what are some of the strategies around major hemorrhage? Well, the key thing is to stop the bleeding and restore the circulating volume. One of the biggest interventions um, that, that we do for lower GI bleeding is blood products, the use of red blood cells. Um, you know, up to a third of patients who come into hospital with lower GI bleeding will require some form of blood, blood product transfusion. So that is, this is really the mainstay of our treatment for those who are actually needing an intervention. Major hemorrhage, of course, is classified, uh, as we all know, um, in these three ways. But of course, pragmatically, it's going back to that use of the shock index of knowing who is someone who's active bleeding and requires blood products to maintain circulatory volume. In your hospital, of course, major transfusion and shock packs should be protocol driven. We should have a low threshold to request these. Uh, and, and when, we're, when we have suspicion and concern regarding uh, people's clinical status. But early transfusion uh, of, of, of platelets in a fixed ratio to red cells, and that's included in your shock pack, has been shown to reduce coagulopathy and reduce bleeding. Um, and there's some evidence now, or certainly a lot of evidence, to support the use of restrictive transfusion in upper GI, uh, in upper GI bleeding, which has seen to reduce from mortality. And, and that's what came across in, in, in Dr. Oakland's audit, was that we can overuse blood products on occasion, and that can be associated with transfusion reactions and uh, re-bleeding. Permissive hypertension is something that we commonly use in trauma and again has its uses in um, any sort of form of GI hemorrhage and, and trying to avoid clot disruption uh, and dilutional coagulopathy associated with lots of use of crystalloid. And this is something that we should be utilized in GI bleeding. One of the big uh, factors, as we've discussed, is the use of anti-hemostatic agents. So, num older population, the greater use of anticoagulants. 
This is a, um, a piece of work we did in 2017, presented at the ASGBI uh, with my colleagues, uh, Southmead Hospital in Bristol. And it showed that pa patients who presented on aspirin and warfarin were more likely to require transfusion compared to those who were not in anti anti-hemostatic therapy. And similarly, patients receiving dual antiplatelet therapy or parental anticoagulation were more likely to require emergency intervention. NOACs were not more like uh, people on NOACs were no more likely to require transfusion or intervention than those not on anti-hemostatic therapy. So um, this has a major implications on the basis of our treatment. Uh, Dr. Olkin's guidelines, um, there was five recommendations uh, from or six recommendations from her guidance. Uh, around anticoagulation and uh, briefly summarize stop and reverse warfarin um, early and that can be using uh, Beriplex um, or if possible withhold and the use of vitamin K. Um, restart low molecular heparin high risk patients, those with a heart valve um, and patients who um, cannot be off anticoagulants for the, for, for the risks and that should be performed within 40 hours. Um, aspirin for primary prophylaxis should be permanently discontinued and aspirin for secondary prevention uh, is not routinely stopped unless indicated. Dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for coronary stent should ideally not be stopped but uh, should a discussion with the cardiology team is advised. And no acts should be stopped and be started at a maximum of seven days after hemorrhage is stopped. And we all know there's the reversal agents for these. And, and more recently, of course, we've had, certainly in the last few years, we have had reversal agents coming onto the market for NOAX, uh, the um, um, monoclonal antibody for dabigatran and adenexamide alpha uh, for the use of rivoxaban and apixaban. So these are available through your hospital pharmacy and, and through hematology. And uh, um, we fairly... Uh, should be fairly um, aware of the other um, reversal agents for aspirin, cabirigo, and warfarin. Trans transamic acid is a useful thing to discuss, um, and certainly in the last few years, this uh, large multi-centre randomised control trial was published. We were using TXA a lot, uh, and it was you know from the CRASH two trial we felt this was uh, beneficial. Uh, but of course, this randomised control trial, which uh, put TXA versus placebo showed no significant difference seen in the primary outcome, which was death at five days, or any of the secondary outcomes, which are numerous. Uh, the only uh, significant thing they did demonstrate was an increase in VTE. So tr transamic acid cannot be recommended in, the, in lower GI bleeding. Investigations, well, we've certainly, you know, no one comes into hospital nowadays without a CT, and I think CT angiography has been hugely helpful uh, and, and identifying people who are actively bleeding, but also identifying the site of bleeding. Lower GI endoscopy um, has its uses. Uh, it's a fairly high uh, diagnostic yield, um, but overall it's probably not something that's the go-to first-line investigation in most hospitals. And of course, we discussed the, the use of upper GI endoscopy for those who have, at, who have brisk uh, lower GI bleeding in terms of ruling out a possible upper GI source, especially when you've not demonstrated a source or identified a bleeding uh, site on CTA. Just more brief, um, a bit more detail about CTA angiogram. It's very sensitive, it's very specific. Uh, it's available out of ours. Um, it's uh, good for localizing a bleeding point and that's key in determining what therapeutic interventions are possible. Um, of course, it's not a therapeutic intervention itself. And you, the key thing here is the need for active bleeding, lead up to, uh, 0 0.35 to 1 mil a minute of bleeding to identify a bleeding site. So the timing of this is imperative. It's going back to that shock index. If you think the person's actually bleeding, then using a, getting a CT angiogram is useful. De a delay to CT angiogram is likely to result in a negative or uh, no bleeding site identified, and it can be uh, not particularly useful. Although CT can demonstrate other pathology within the colon, diverticular disease or tumour, which may be helpful. So we've got the best source of identifying a slight bleeding, which is CT angiogram. So what do we do about that? Well, as I said before, when we discussed the etiology, this is dictated by the identification of bleeding sites and the underlying cause. So, um, you know, we've got hemorrhoids and, you, and that's definitely the source and there's no other bleeding source than CT angiogram. And of course, going straight for an EUA and intervention would be the right thing to do. But gen, for general uh, lower GI bleeding, um, Interventional radiology and embolization, selective embolization, 
uh, is there's some or certainly some reasonable evidence about that, around that. Endoscopic intervention, again, the, the general feeling uh, on the ground or in the hospitals is it's not hugely used, um, but it's something that can be considered and it certainly should be considered in the first line according to the um, published guidance. Now, as we're going to discuss surgery, really the indications for surgery is very, very low and should be avoided if possible. So endoscopic intervention itself, it's good to remember that, of course, all the therapies that are available in lower, upper GI bleeding are available in lower GI bleeding. Um, but because it's something that's not routinely performed in hospitals, the, the experience of this is, is less. And it really takes for a fairly um, experienced endoscopic unit to provide this. But um, from, our, from some of the work we did in Bristol, certainly 24% of our patients being admitted for lower GI bleeding will end up having some form of endoscopic assessment. But majority of these will be for flexible sigmoidoscopy and that will be for looking for assessment of colitis. Um, and you know, endoscopy is useful in management of flat mucosal lesions like angiodysplasia when we identify a site on CTA. It's not available out of ours, and the limitations can be around the failure procedure, procedure around uh, with bowel preparation, which is necessary, of course, although uh, blood itself is a natural laxative. And there is some, some fears, although evidence would not suggest uh, to support this, but fears around perforation and especially around diverticular disease with the interventions we'd use in upper GI bleeding. Selective angio, uh, angiogram and selective embolization would be certainly one of the first go-to uh, options. And, um, but again, in most audits, and certainly audit that we perform, uh, the use of radiological intervention, again, is pretty low. Most of these cases will settle without intervention. And the, obviously the, the, the main uh, issue around intervention radiology is having access to this. And this is something that, that came through in, in both the um, NC pod review and uh, Dr. Auckland's uh, audit was the, the ability to have access to 24-7 interventional radiology, which as you can see from the audit, was only, that was only true in 54.9% of sites. So it's something that's not available, um, but I suspect that has changed over the last five years from these reviews in terms of having clear pathways. And, and you may all well be aware of all the pathways to follow in your own hospitals. Uh, the thing to mention there is, of course, embolization is not without complications. And in some, in some studies are reported uh, up to 20% of patients requiring surgery after embolization due to either an early or late re-bleed or ischemic complications. So every effort should be uh, in, in, uh, try to avoid surgery. I mean, from our audit in Bristol, the, the, the likelihood of requiring surgery is less than, was less than 1%. I know that came across in, in, the, in Dr. Oakland's audit. Um, if surgery is to be employed, the importance of identifying a bleeding point um, is, really, is, is really clear. Um, and CT Androgram has helped us do that. And of course, there's an unknown bleeding point. Uh, total colectomy with a stoma is something that was always taught as an option, bringing an end out and seeing whether that was had stopped the bleeding. And, and if it hadn't, then you had uh, you knew which site, which end the bleeding had uh, continued. Um, this was a large review in America in 2012 and 2013 um, from the American uh, College of Surgeons database. And it showed that of all the 38,486 resections performed in a year, only 427 were performed for bleeding. So it really is a very, very small um, uh, number of patients undergoing surgery for bleeding. And that would be true of hospitals in the UK. Um, but interestingly, from that study, of course, 85% of people underwent a partial colectomy. I think that's suggestive of, of the use of CTA and, and its ability to um, actually localise bleeding points, which makes surgical intervention far easier. We can't have a discussion, uh, we've mentioned a number of times, the increasing uh, elderly and frail, uh, frail population that we're admitting. And we can't really have a discussion about lower jab bleeding without just mentioning this particular cohort of patients. And I think it's, it's important to say that we need to employ realistic medicine. But I do think there's a, a lot of merits in a diagnosis while uh, these patients are uh, inpatients because that will help guide uh, future management. So that may be something simple like a non-contrast CT and a, and a rectal examination uh, to allow um, inpatient um, 
uh, man management, but also to assist primary care in making decisions in the community whether these patients should be readmitted. We've all seen the same uh, elderly and frail patient being admitted on numerous occasions with lower GI bleeding, where there isn't, hasn't really been a cause identified. And I think if you can identify a cause and, and structure a management plan for primary care, that should avoid unnecessary, uh, unnecessary emissions. And of course, that will also help uh, discussions around the risk benefit of continued anticoagulation therapy or antiplatelet therapy in these patients. Traditionally, of course, we would employ a, um, a follow-up strategy of offering patients either an inpatient or an outpatient colonoscopy. But I think with the use of QFIT, it's something that we have employed in NHS Fourth Valley to try and reduce the burden on, on the endoscopy department, particularly uh, you know, in the post-COVID uh, era. And so these are patients who are presented with, uh, as we're going to discuss, the open score of less than eight. So these are stable lower GI bleeders, we can offer them a QFIT, which they can perform in the following four to six weeks. And of course, if this was elevated and there was persistent bleeding, then that would mitigate a, or necessitate a urgent colonoscopy. If they had persistent bleeding and a negative QFIT, then we would still pursue an urgent colonoscopy. And if they had no bleeding and a negative QFIT, then that's, that's the kind of the, the and their investigations were formed. And this is to just try and take some pressure off the endoscopy department. So in summary, um, this is a very common emergency general surgical presentation. It very rarely requires surgical intervention. And I think what's been highlighted in the uh, in the recent guidance and from Dr. Oakland's audit is that there's a real importance of developing local and regional pathways for the management of lower GI bleeding. And this should be in conjunction and, and coordinated with your upper GI bleeding pathway because there is some similarities and we need to focus on uh, easy access to interventional radiology. And there's some dubiety around uh, uh, colonoscopy, inpatient colonoscopy, I would say, in terms of, of the kind of national experience and what we can offer, but certainly more research into what intervention is right, intervention radiology uh, embolization versus colonoscopy is something that could be performed. And it's certainly something we could all do better is to focus on appropriate use of blood products and uh, the use of restricted transfusion where possible, because we know that is associated with a reduced mortality, rebleed. Um, and transfusion reaction. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to take questions after the second presentation. Is that right, uh, Michael? Uh, yeah, that's correct, James. So if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, I'm going to hand over to my co-chair, and that's Demetrius Damascos, uh, who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So um, my name is Dimitris Tamakos. I'm a general surgeon in Edinburgh. And um, before I introduce the next speaker, I'll say a brief story. She won't remember it. So we used to work at the same hospital. And then um, I got, um, um, you know, I got introduced to her by one of our bosses there. And I still remember his words. He said, this is Kate Auckland. She's the national lead for lower GI bleeding. And in a few years, Everyone in the UK, when they think lower GI bleeding, they will say Kate Auckland. That's what he said in 2015. And apparently he was right. Kate, I will tell you afterwards who that was. But um, so Dr. Catherine Auckland, who is the national lead of the um, UK audit on lower GI bleeding, who has the score after her name. Kate, thank you. Thanks very much. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Um, so yeah, that's a very kind introduction, but I think I have to remain humble and, and remind myself that this, this is still rectal bleeding. So let's not get too glamorous and carried away with all of this. But as we say, you know, it's it's a very common problem. And I certainly used to find when I was a surgical registrar, it was a real heart sink because you get a frail elderly patient on loads of antiplatelets, maybe a new DOAC, bleeding from the bottom. They've been in several times. They had diverticular disease. 
what are you going to do? There's really poor evidence for interventions that change outcomes. Um, and so I started doing a study in 2015 when there were no national guidelines. There was nothing in the US, there's nothing in Europe, there's nothing in the UK. And we thought, actually, this is low hanging fruit. We can do something fairly useful here to try and change management. Um, but the story of this changed slightly as I went through, as I sort of found out a little bit more about the condition. So as referenced, I ran the national audit of this, which was conducted across the NHS in 2015. Um, we managed to coordinate prospective case identification. Um, and it was the largest, it probably still is, the largest prospective database of its kind in the country, although there's some really good international work coming through. We had over 80% of hospitals um, participate and two and a half thousand patients. And we've already sort of touched on the, the types of diagnosis we'd see in the UK with this, but I think the really important thing to take, um, just building um, on the previous presentation, was that intervention is, is fairly rare. So, you know, I, I'm always in the bad books of the endoscopist at the moment because I advocate doing inpatient colonoscopy. That's maybe an argument for another day. But we know many patients don't have this and arguably many patients don't need it. There's a lot of CT scanning happening. And a lot of it is um, without CT angiography. And you sort of think, well, other than seeing maybe a, a solid lesion, bit of diverticular disease, what are you going to find? But one of the most important findings from the audit was that nearly half of patients were bleeding significantly enough to be admitted to hospital, but had no inpatient investigations, yeah, cool. nothing. And so that's pretty important when you realise that on average, those patients were staying in hospital for about three to four days. So a significant resource utilisation. But of the patients that were having things done. I said, you know, intervention was really quite rare. The, the most common I used very lightly because it was only 2% was endoscopic hemostasis used in a range of, of different conditions. Embolization used in less than 1% of patients, but really importantly, rates of laparotomy, hardly any, only six in the entire order. And this was laparotomy for exsanguinating hemorrhage, not for cancer, not for obstructing lesions. This is just a laparotomy to treat the bleeding. And so actually there is an argument as our surgeons, the best place people to be looking after these may be an argument for a different day. But all of these um, interventions were associated with complications, could be re-bleeding, the only definitive treatment was surgery, or in the endoscopic group, perforations, in the embolization group, ischemias. Um, but some really important findings from the laparotomies that were conducted, oh, let's go back, were that of the six patients that did have a laparotomy, three of them died. And, and so this is the important thing to think about when you're working through the recommendations from the national guidance, which maybe at times don't feel that they make sense for what you're doing locally. We have to avoid doing laparotomies in people who are bleeding from the lower GI tract because the mortality rate is so high and particularly blind laparotomies. How do you know which bit of the colon you're going to remove if you don't, if you haven't localized the bleeding? It's really tough. And that's why the guideline says to localize the bleeding first, be it with CT angiography or endoscopy. But going back to the audit, what I went into it thinking I would do is I'd try and put together a risk score like an upper GI bleeding to predict mortality or re-bleeding and say, okay, this is our score. We predict these patients. They have a higher risk of adverse outcome. We're going to do these interventions, which will mitigate that and things will get better. But actually, we don't know which interventions really impact outcome. And so many patients don't have interventions at all and don't come to harm. And so that's what this slide is about. So Two, nearly two and a half thousand patients. The biggest intervention was transfusion. Some patients re -blurred, some patients had interventions, but there's all of this lot that had nothing done. Can we intervene with these ones? They've had no interventions, no adverse outcomes. Do they need to be admitted? If we can identify these in A&E, can we send them home without patient management and focus our resources on those that do re-bleed, those that do have an increased risk of death? Those that, those that do need intervention. And so that's why we started working on a risk score that would identify the absence of adverse outcomes. And I'll come back to that um, just quickly, but you know, I, I realize who I'm talking to here. So you lot will probably be fairly familiar with Rockall, Glasgow, Blatchford, and actually in upper GI bleeding, the stakes are higher, the adverse outcomes are much more common. And that's why these scores are designed to predict death, transfusion, intervention, et cetera, because there's evidence that these interventions will change your outcome. 
but I really think that risk sh school should add value. And that can be something like informing your patients so you can have a meaningful discussion around consent, risk of adverse outcome, but ideally they need to change management. I'm hoping in the next few years, we'll see loads of new risk schools coming out on your job leadings, which is better than the one I developed because it's not the best at some of the things we need it to do. Um, but just a word of warning and how to interpret some of the papers that come out. So drawing a receiver operator characteristic curve is not enough. That's not, that's quite meaningless. You need to look at the C statistic and that will give you a number. Number one is the perfect predicted tool. That basically doesn't exist. 0.5, you might as well flip a coin. Your score is no good. If you're hitting 0.8, that's pretty good, some clinical value, but ideally want risk scores that have an ROC with a C statistic of more than 0.9 for them to be able to influence clinical practice. So I put together a risk score which would identify patients at extremely low risk of adverse outcome. I wanted it to be really simple, so only seven variables, one blood test, so you're not waiting for hours and hours for something complicated to come back. And it had to be really easy to calculate so that our junior colleagues, F2 in A&E in the middle of the night when they've had no sleep and they're really dehydrated, can calculate their score and it can help them make a decision about who to send home. And actually that's, as we all know, that's some of the scariest decisions you make, particularly when you're junior. And then we can focus more of our brain cells on what to do with the patients who are unstable, who need CT angiography versus endoscopy, et cetera. So we developed the score in the UK population and then externally validated it in 38,000 patients in the US. And the findings are pretty consistent that if your patient scores eight or less, there's a 95% chance that they will be completely fine to send home from A&E. The 5% risk that something adverse does happen, most of that is driven by them needing a red cell transfusion. And as transfusion practice improves over the next few years, actually the sensitivity profile will get better because we're probably giving some people blood and arguably they didn't need it. So in the US, um, this was a retrospective study um, a large number of hospitals, we just pulled ICD-10 ICD codes consistent with OGI bleeding um, and we calculated it for all of these and, and had a look at what the adverse outcomes were, but also what the interventions were. And actually the Americans say that they do something very different with lower GI bleeding. They claim that they scope loads of them. They claim that the um, risk of death is much higher and they claim that they stay in much longer, but actually they don't, it's really similar. Um, so 4.4% rates of mortality similar to the UK. Um, and again, it's not sure on this slide, but the rates of, of endoscopic intervention are, are very low. Now, one of the problems with the Oakland score is that um, it doesn't identify that many patients who are safe for immediate discharge. And so we also had a look at them if we could extend the score to nine or to 10 to identify people to send home. And in the US population, we found that the threshold of less than eight, which is what the BSG recommends to use to send people home was found in just under 9% of patients, which is maybe not that useful. If you extend that to 10, it's found in nearly 18%. So that's a little bit more useful, but this is where we need to do further research on this. Are the thresholds too low? If we're gonna have a meaningful impact in resource utilization, can we safely extend it to capture more patients? And then just going back to the algorithm, which you've seen already. So this is the BSG algorithm. So we've talked about the left-hand side of it. Uh, and just a couple of things to add. The beauty of doing a CT angiogram, if your patient has is got significant bleeding enough to show up, is that it will show you a bleeding point anywhere in the GI tract upper or lower. So then you have your localized bleeding, you can send them off to your gastroenterologist if it's an upper GI bleed or you hang on to them if it's lower. Um, and then the beauty of that is that it's located ideally the bleeding point if you are having to take them to surgery. But timing is everything. So if they're unstable, you need to get on with a CT angiography. If there's a blush on that and you're going to do embolization, do not hang around. Ideally, you should be getting your patient in to have the embolization within 60 minutes. And that's why the networks for offering these things are so important. But just quickly swinging onto the other side of the algorithm. So if you've identified that your patient is, is stable, so they have a normal shock index, calculate a risk score. Now we didn't definitively say use the Oakland score for this. 
because it's not perfect. Somebody else needs to develop a better one. So please do that. Um, but what you do need to do is you need a way of identifying major versus minor bleeding. And if it's a major bleeder, the BSG recommend admitting for colonoscopy on the next available list, which has got loads of contentious problems around it in terms of resource utilization. And absolutely, if you've got a frail elderly patient that won't tolerate colonoscopy, don't do it, be pragmatic. If you've got somebody who's had recent investigations, again, if it's not gonna change your management, don't do it. But what we want to get away from are patients with significant bleeding sat on the ward for days at a time, potentially with their antiplatelet switched off for a long time. If you're not going to do anything for them as an inpatient, think about why you're admitting them. And then the other question is, if you're not doing anything and they bleed again, what is your rebleeding plan? And it is okay to do nothing if it's safe, but sometimes we just need the courage to say that and we need to inform our juniors so they're not having lots of imaging and lots of outpatient flexis booked, which aren't going to show anything. Now, there's a bit more guidance has emerged in the last uh, year or so, um, which, which essentially builds on um, the BSG guidance. So the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, um, it does incorporate the Oakland score, very similar to the BSG. Um, and so if there's no adverse clinical features, use an Oakland score of eight or less to send the patient home. But because the Oakland score isn't that good at predicting adverse events, because that's not what it was designed for, um, ESG recommends that no single risk score should be used in isolation to predict adverse outcomes. So again, there's another thing to do a bit of work on there. If we do want to be really good at predicting death, need for intervention, et cetera, a new score will need to be developed for that. Right, that's the end of, of my talk. So handing back over to you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, Michael? Uh, yep, yeah, so um, there's a new feature that we've started, uh, which is ask the experts. And these were questions that were, sorry, there were two questions that were submitted in advance. Let me just find them. So um, the question to our speakers uh, came from uh, Despoina Georgiadou, um, who's a consultant in HPB and pancreatic surgery in uh, I'm sorry, I can't really pronounce this. Tazanio General Hospital of Piraeus. Dimitrios, is that your part of the world? I don't, I... Yeah, that's my part of the world. Uh, okay, part. okay. Did I pronounce it correctly? You're doing well. You're doing well. Okay, grand. So they asked uh, whether you use, uh, whether you have any experience of using tranex, I think it's meant to be tranexamic acid as a bit of a typo, as per protocol in upper and lower GI bleeding and in what doses? Yeah, no, I think we answered. I think we discussed that in, yeah. in my part of the talk about the whole tip trial, and that didn't come up the conclusive or certainly any significant findings. So it can't be recommended in lower GI bleeding. I think there's some, it continues to be looked at, tranexamic acid, because I think the CRASH 2 trial did uh, give us some hope that it was going to be the kind of um, the panacea of, of, of treatment for bleeding, but it doesn't seem to be. And it, there's a recent trial coming out with lower uh, colorectal surgery um, and transamic acid. So it's, it's continued to be looked at, but the evidence would suggest it's, it's, it's not recommended in, with the current evidence. Yeah, and, and just building on that. So Halter actually showed that particularly in upper GI bleeding, which you think often is tends to be venous more than arterial, there were adverse outcomes. There was increased rates of thrombosis, which is why the, the trial said not to be used in GI bleeding. However, like most RCTs, they really under-recruited lower GI bleeders. And so probably we don't know, but at the moment Halter says don't use it. Yeah, I think um, so. I've got to put my trauma hat on, and there's more and more evidence coming out showing about the potential harm that TXA can do in the major trauma population when it's used incorrectly in terms of um, it actually causing thrombosis. So I think definitely it's perhaps not as in vogue as it once was. Uh, the second question from the same person, uh, I think, is probably um, going to be the same answer, but any experience of using somatostatin in either upper or lower GI bleeding? I'm, assu I'm assuming they mean somatostatin analogues. No, I've not, not got any experience. If, if Kate, you've got any, any kind of knowledge of that in the background of... of no, 
I don't believe there's evidence either way. So when I say no evidence, I mean absence of evidence as opposed to evidence saying that it shouldn't be used. Okay. Uh, Dimitrios, uh, have you had a chance to have a look through the chat? Because there were some uh, questions. Yeah, I mean, um, there was um, one question that related, kind of, Kate kind of touched on it, because we discussed about uh, permissive hypotension, which is a, con you know, a concept that has been, um, you know, that has derived from trauma. And there was a question as to whether there is actual evidence, whether this kind of notion is translatable to the... Um, major hemorrhage from the GI tract? So just building, I, th I think my approach to it in GI bleeding is, is it's, as opposed to having permissible hypotension, you just don't, you want to avoid over transfusing. And the evidence for this comes from variceal bleeding in Spain, although it has been repeated in the trigger trial in the UK. Now in upper GI bleeding, there's definitely association with over transfusion and adverse outcomes, re-bleeding and death. However, in the Barcelona trial, when you did a subgroup analysis looking at arterial bleeding, um, so the ulcers, et cetera, the effect wasn't seen. So the two arms are exactly the same. Um, in lower GI bleeding, if you think most of it's driven by diverticular bleeding, which is arterial, probably the effect won't be seen. But I think for our patients, because they're typically elderly on antiplatelets, anticoagulants, the argument is, will they tolerate hypotension? And probably they won't very well. Mm -hmm. James? Yeah, I agree with that. I think the and, and as I say, the evidence has come. There has some. There is some evidence um, from that Spanish trial that was performed. But um, I think I think we've got to look at what we're trying to achieve when we're, we're resuscitating someone with lower GI bleeding. And I think the key thing, of course, is stopping the bleeding, um, and you know, just throwing lots of blood products at it and not focusing on trying to uh, turn off the tap um, will lead to over transfusion. Uh, and lead to a slightly uh, different goal setting. I think the goal setting is to, to restore circulating volume, but ultimately to stop the bleeding. I think that's what we need to focus on. Um, uh, Michael, do you mind if I ask a question? Is it okay? Of course. So um, it was mentioned on both presentations, um, the importance of frailty and the fact that a lot of the patients who present with a lower GI bleed are usually frail people on um, some sort of anticoagulation. Frailty has increasingly been recognized as an independent factor for worse outcomes. It's stemmed from, well, I mean, in the kind of type of literature I read, it stems, you know, from emergency laparotomy data. And I wanted to ask um, if there is, if, have, if you're aware of any literature comparing frailty status to the overall outcomes or perhaps some sort of, um, perhaps an idea for the future, Kate, some sort of index that also incorporates a frailty score into that equation? Yeah, that's a great question. And certainly when I derived the Oakland score, we didn't include a marker of frailty in it. Although I think we might have tried something like albumin and, and also, um, if you think surrogate markers of frailty, so antiplatelets and anticoagulants, and certainly the antiplatelets and anticoagulants weren't predictive of outcome. But definitely you, you'd assume that if you can add in a marker of frailty into your algorithm, it, it potentially would change, change your outcomes. And so I think that'd be a really interesting thing to do a piece of research on if anybody's got any interest. There's an interesting study that you could do looking at everybody's had a CT angio. You could probably get a marker of uh, sarcopenia looking at their psoas muscles. Um, so that, that's, I've done that in major trauma. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't do that for uh, acute lower GI bleeding. Um, so uh, if anybody's keen to do something like that, I think that that's definitely um, the way to go. And clearly adding in uh, so the what's the score that they use now for uh, frailty assessment? It's, it's just gone out of my head. Um, it's, it'll come to me in a moment. Or not, perhaps. Uh, Jane Kilkenny, a previous colleague of mine, has asked, um, what was the name of the trial that was mentioned looking at TXA in lower GI bleeding? Um, Holt it trial. And was it, there's another trial that's ongoing, is, it, is that right? 
Yeah, so there's a, there's a trial um, that's, there's a pilot study about to start on colorectal bleeding with TXA. So use of, use of TXA in major colorectal resections, um, but it's not started yet. I'm going to have to wrap the brains for the name, but I'll get, I can get you. Okay, okay. Yeah. Also, one of our colleagues, Michael, I mean, I, I know that this is not exactly the, you know, the, the theme of these presentations, but uh, this, the occasion of small bowel bleeding has been mentioned. And I know that it is fairly uncommon in overall. And I mean, I'd like to ask Kate whether you have included small bowel bleeding in validating your score or was it just colonic bleeding and whether you have any thoughts on that and then we can ask James perhaps what about endoscopic management as well. Yeah so small bowel bleeders were definitely included in the audit although we don't know essentially which patients it was because so few had investigations. Um, there were a very small number that went on to have things like double balloon enteroscopy but it was vanishingly rare. But one of the things that is very useful for doing CT angiography, if you're going to end up operating on somebody with a Meckles, et cetera, is actually identifying that the bleeding point is in the mid GI tract as opposed to the lower GI tract because your surgical approach will be different. James, and it's also intraoperative endoscopy was mentioned in the question. So the use of intraoperative endoscopy. You know, I've, I've certainly used it um, on a couple of occasions in, in the unknown site when you've got someone who's unstable and you, you, you put a, a scope down the ileum after mobilising the white colon. So I think, I think it can be used. I think it all comes, also comes down to whether you, it's going to harbour positive results. So the big thing about any endoscopy in, in bleeding is are you going to get the view uh, that you acquire to identify a subtle um, causal lesion, which is the, uh, a hugely uh, difficult thing, uh, even in the prepared bowel. So, um, yeah, I think it can be used, absolutely. I think in, in, in the face of, uh, of, a, of someone who's unstable and you need intervention, I think it's something that, that, that we can use, but whether it will be fruitful or not is difficult to say. Um, and I think that would come back to the point about colonoscopic intervention. It is, you know, other parts of the world, it's, it's, it's far more utilised than, as, as Kate said, um, I think our experience of most institutions in, in the UK is that we don't use endoscopic um, intervention hugely. And although there is some, some evidence to suggest we, we should, um, and, and certainly that's what's been recommended. So it's, it's certainly an interesting thing to look at and, and see how that could be fit, could sort of um, could be utilised in, in their current uh, makeup of GI bleeding in hospitals. Is a post polypectomy bleeding a different beast to other types of? Bleeding. No, I think conser the conservative route of post polypectomy bleeding is often um, is often employed, and I think uh, it can always go back to like like we do with diabetic bleeding is often a trial of, of conservative management. Um, but yes, I mean the, the point of that is you're kind of knowing if it's suspected the, the benefit of that is you know where the source is. The, the, the you should have documented photographs and site of where that polyp has been removed which means it's easier to find, identify, and also treat. So if, if, if that's, that's, that's some of the benefits of, of, of you kind of pre-warned um, uh, in terms of the success of an intervention. I might have to respectfully disagree there. I hope you don't mind. Ooh, actually, oh, I love it. Controversy. Go. Go. And actually, in, in the BSG guidance, there's a separate section for post-polypectomy figures and exactly the reasons you list you know where the bleeding is coming from if you've done your polypectomy logically and you've only cleared quadrant by quadrant as opposed to doing loads. Um, your endoscopist probably has an idea that they're likely to bleed anyway, judging by the size of the stalk, et cetera. And so for those, um, the algorithm is much more focused towards just get on, do your colonoscopy, go back to the site where you, which you probably had some, some trouble with when you were doing the first polypectomy anyway. Uh, and actually, the, I think the evidence for doing prompt colonoscopy in those is slightly better than it is for your general lower GI bleeding population. I, I, I do I wouldn't disagree with that. I think pragmatically I think that's probably not what we what we see on the on the ground, but I think you're absolutely right. And I think I think I do wonder if that comes from the fact that lower GI bleeding is admitted under surgeons. And upper GI bleeding is admitted under uh, on the holes and under under a gastroenterologist and, and I guess that may and you know uh, certainly 
change the, the how aggressive we are with endoscopic management, but that's something to, that could be looked at certainly in, in other in, in trials. And so, and just building on that, the evidence around colonoscopy and low GI bleeding is rubbish. And so, that for there was an idea certainly in the US and in the Far East for a while that we should be doing colonoscopy within twenty four hours. That probably doesn't make that doesn't get you much of a, an advantage versus doing them a few days after that with better bowel prep. Um, but I get loads of flack about this and I, and I, you know, I don't scope at the moment, so maybe I'm not placed to say, but actually if hardly any of our patients are being endoscoped, we're not going to find bleeding lesions that are amenable to treatment because we're not looking. Yeah. So, so where do you, okay. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time and uh, the, the evening uh, uh, kind of dwindling away. Um, where do you think we should go next? Um, with lower GI bleeding, what, 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 what's the big gaping hole in knowledge from your two's perspective? Well, I'll, I'll mention one thing, and it's not so much about knowledge, but I think it's, it, it leads on from the work that, that Kate, it can't be underestimated. I you know Kate's been very modest about what she's done, but what she's identified, she's looked at an area which wasn't, you know, wasn't well um, published upon and I think what's recognised is we do as hospitals, individual hospitals and, and general surgeons and gastroenterologists need to have a coordinated effort around lower, uh, around GI bleeding as a whole and we shouldn't separate these as two entities we need to have hospital wild wide protocols for bleeding because these patients will present to numerous places in a &E, medical wards there needs to be a very very clear guidance in your hospital i think that's what we could all do is go away and look at our pathways and ensure that our pathways are, are, are robust so anyone in the hospital can access these um so that that's what i would say certainly what we, we can we can take from from kate's work in terms of i mean kate will know much more about where the, the areas of, of of further research we need to do i don't know what, what your kind of first thoughts on that are kate Two, we need two, two multi-site RCTs, so I don't know if you're feeling up for it. We need an RCT looking at timing of colonoscopy, and that should also include outpatients. Why are we bringing people in for six-week flexies? You know, how often do you find anything? Um, and the other thing is we need a direct head-to-head -head RCT looking at comparing endoscopic hemostasis with embolization. There isn't one, and it would be great to know. Yeah, I often worry about the patient that goes down to the IR suite and takes three to four hours to get uh, control of bleeding. Uh, I think you get the same uh, problems with upper GI bleeding as you do with major trauma. And I think these patients often fall into this physiologically compromised abyss with, um, with nobody having that thing, oh God, I can't be here for three hours because I need to turn off the tap in 30 minutes. Um, so yeah, it's a, bit, a little bit of a bugbear of mine. Um, it's five minutes to, um, I propose that we draw the meeting to a close and it's almost nine o'clock where I am. And, uh, I just, on behalf of myself and Demetrios, I wanted to thank, uh, Kate, uh, for agreeing to give up her evening, um, and to talk about the Oakland score and also, uh, to James A for putting up, working with me and my little rants that I go on. And finally, I wanted to actually thank Max Marsden for uh, digging me out of a hole and coming up with the name of the frailty score, um, Rockwood score. So um, without further ado, um, thank you everybody again for attending and um, we'll be back next month. And from memory, we're going to do acute hernias. So there'll be more details up on the TUGS website in the next couple of weeks. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone.